morning, we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. I've already told you something of what the text is about. It's about the 10 lepers who are healed. And the things that this passage teaches us regarding Jesus, regarding his plan uh, for uh, Israel, regarding his plan for us, but also regarding what our response should be to the Lord's mercy in our lives, particularly his saving uh, mercy. So let's begin by reading the passage in verses, uh, again, Luke 17, verses 11 through um, 19. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of his word to our hearing. Let me just mention ahead of time that the way that I'm approaching this particular sermon is going to be a little bit different than what I've done in the past. This one seemed to lend itself more towards just simply going through it, uh, almost section by section, rather than a more structured approach. And uh, I'll bring in whatever review I'm just going to bring in towards the, uh, towards the end of the sermon. So let's think about it in these terms. Now, when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, it was for his last Passover. We see we're in the later chapters here of Luke, where he was going to be betrayed and where he was going to suffer and he was going to die for us. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to lay down his life. Now, while passing between Samaria and Galilee, uh, and this, this would be then, uh, you know, it was very common for the Jews to try to avoid Samaria altogether. Jesus, as we know from uh, earlier chapters of John, did not always avoid Samaria, and as we're going to be reminded uh, also later in the sermon. Uh, but they would walk then, skirting the borders, finding various ways to get around it. On this occasion, Jesus was not intending to enter into Samaria to, to do ministry because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it's put in terms of setting his face like flint. Nothing was going to dissuade him. This was what he needed to do. So as he did this, walking along the borders between these two particular areas, he entered into a village. As he did, ten leprous men met him, standing some distance away. Now, lepers, as you probably know, were social outcasts. They had a very dangerous disease, a very disfiguring and crippling disease that made their lives somewhat short and certainly very miserable. And because they were a threat to a healthy society, because we know that uh, this was a contagious disease, they were prohibited by God's law from entering into a town or a village. And that's likely the reason why they uh, are said here to be standing at a distance. Jesus entered the village. They were standing at a distance. They were standing outside the village. Now, they likely didn't just run into Jesus. They didn't just happen to run into him. It's more likely that they came out looking for Jesus. They, they knew the Passover was close. They knew that Jesus would faithfully attend that Passover as he attended all the Passovers. It was one of the three required feasts that all Jewish men had to attend on an annual basis. And of course, if you love the Lord and you wanted to honor the Lord, that's what you would do. And certainly Jesus' greatest desire was to honor his Father by regarding everything that the Lord told him to do in his word. That's how he obtained a perfect righteousness for us so that he might give it to us so that we might enter into heaven. Now, because of this, they thought he might pass this way as he was traveling from his home, which was in Galilee, uh, to Jerusalem. 
And remember, Samaria is between Galilee and, uh, and Judea where Jerusalem is. And it's also likely that these men knew or had heard that Jesus was close. Now, the reason they came to find Jesus was that they believed. They believed from what they had heard about Jesus, uh, maybe from what they had seen him do, that he could cure their condition. And so they went out looking for him, and when they found him, they immediately began to ask him uh, what it is they sought him for. They began to plead with him from a distance. Verse 13, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And really, every one of God's people, every one of God's creation, everybody who exists in the world is in need of mercy and ought to be crying out to the Lord for his mercy. That's what these men were doing, and they happened to be more acutely aware of the mercy they needed because of this disease. But when Jesus saw them, he responded. He responded in the way that he would if we had called out to him for mercy, if we had been there and had been in need. He responded in the way that he would have us respond when we see somebody in need of mercy who calls out also to us. His heart was moved, moved with compassion. The Lord Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Spirit is the Spirit of love, love towards God, love towards his neighbor. That's the kind of life our Lord Jesus Christ lived. Throughout the Gospels, we see that he really cared about those who were around him, even though he knew the condition of their hearts and he knew what kind of people they were. And he ministered to them, either when he saw the need that they had or when they came to him for help. And of course, that's what our Lord Jesus Christ would have us to do as well. Now, these 10 men came to him. They cried to him for mercy. And Jesus' heart was full of compassion. And so they were not disappointed he told them to go and show themselves to the priests. Now, he didn't do that just to get rid of them, you know, just kind of go your way and, and while you're turned the other way, then I'll escape. No, that's not what he was doing. But the reason why he sent them to the priests was because it was his intention to, to heal them. Now, if you were a leper in those days, you would go to the priest really for only one of two reasons. If you first coming down with the disease, you would go there for the priest to examine you to find out whether or not you have it. And if you did have it, the priest's duty was to declare you to be unclean and to be an outcast from society for the sake of your family and for the sake of your neighbors so that you don't pass the disease on to them. That's one reason why you would go. The other reason would be to be re-examined because you believe that somehow you had been cured of this disease. Now, this was something that would have been rare in the days before Jesus came. As a matter of fact, some have suggested it may not have happened at all. It was a very rare thing that a leper would be healed. But if a leper were healed, they would go to the priest. And the priest would examine, and then he would declare you to be clean. And if you were, then you could re-enter into society. It was much like going to a doctor. You know, one of the things you don't read about, at least that I can recall, in the Old Testament are doctors. You don't see doctors anywhere. That's because the priests were essentially these doctors. They were the experts on what was wrong with you and whether or not you could be around other people or not. You would go to them to get an educated opinion, just like we go to the doctors today for that very purpose. Now, these ten men obviously had been declared unclean. They were lepers. So it would have been clear that Jesus was sending them to the priest not to be diagnosed with the disease, but rather he was sending them to the priest that the priest might declare them to be clean. By the way, I should mention they were somewhere between Galilee and Samaria, as it were, and they had to go to Judea in order to go to the priest. They had to go to Jerusalem. That's where he was sending them. That was a little bit of a walk, but a place that they were willing to go. But you see, Jesus would only have done this if he was intending to heal them. That's why he sent them to the priests. And we read that they went, which tells us something about them. They would have only gone and listened to Jesus if they believed that he actually was going to heal them. They had faith. But here's where we need to make a few distinctions about the kinds of faith that we might possibly have. They had the kind of faith that believed 
that God was able to do miracles, that Jesus was able to do miracles. They had what was called the faith of miracles. When, if you had that, you could receive a miracle. You could be healed. Now, we shouldn't necessarily see this as saving faith, I think, as we're going to see from the results, with the exception of the one person who returns. Now, as they went, they were cleansed. They were healed. You know, during the week when I was preparing this message, I thought I would just do a little bit of review of what leprosy is and what it does and look at some pictures of people who are lepers, and it's, it's not a pretty sight. I mean, they're basically covered with, with blisters. There's these weird growths that are all over their body. They're, sometimes their eyes are, are just rotted out of their head. And their fingers are gone, sometimes whole limbs. They're disfigured. They're, they're, they look horrible. Uh, we understand that the disease kills their, their sensitivity. To, they can't feel things anymore. And we understand because of that, they might rub their nose off their face. I mean, that, that happens. But of course, the reason why the nose comes off is not just because they don't feel anything. It's also because the disease is literally eating away at them. So we shouldn't think of these as just having like little scabs and they look at, oh, the scab's gone now. I'm I'm clean. We don't know exactly what kind of condition these people were in, but they looked at themselves and they realized that they were healed of this horrible disease. The blisters were gone. The skin had, had been restored. It was now healthy looking. Uh, it's possible that they had missed some body parts. And those body parts were restored. Maybe nose or fingers or toes or, or eyes, maybe even arms or legs. But they were well and whole again and it was obvious to them that Jesus had healed them. Now, they must not have gone very far before this miracle took place because of what we read in verses 15 and 16. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Now, he was close enough to Jesus, because Jesus was traveling, remember. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He probably wasn't intending to stay there for terribly long. But this man was close enough to him. When he saw that he was healed, he was able to turn back and quickly find where Jesus was. And he was overwhelmed by the mercy that he had been shown. I mean, put yourself in this man's place for a moment. As a leper, I mean, you're essentially destitute. This disease would have taken absolutely everything away from you. It would take away your health, take away your livelihood. I mean, you can't work at, at any vocation and make money. Take away your family. You can't live with them any longer. You take away your friends. The only people you know would be the, the lepers who were with you uh, in the particular colonies in which you lived. And if you were a leper, all you would have to look forward to from the time you were diagnosed with this terrible disease to the time that you died was a miserable and agonizing existence in a very grotesque condition. Okay? That was the man's condition. And Jesus had given his life back to him. And actually, he gave him more than that, as we're going to see in a moment. Now, this man couldn't just walk away. I mean, the others, they just kept on going. But he couldn't just walk away from the one who had done this for him, so he returned to give glory to God. He honored God openly with a loud voice for everyone to hear. Now, again, there's some speculation here. We don't know exactly what personality type this person was. You know, he might have been the very outgoing kind of person that broadcasts everything that's going on in his life, everything that happens to him, so everybody knows or he could have been more reserved, you know, the kind of person who keeps all the details of his life to himself. But we do know this, that whatever the case, he was so overwhelmed with joy that he just couldn't hold on to it. He had to speak, nor was he going to forget the one through whom God had done these things. And notice, he fell on his face before Jesus. This evening, we're going to look at what the word worship means. It essentially means to fall down to fall down and prostrate yourself on the ground and to worship, even to kiss the feet of someone. He fell on his face before Jesus. This is an act of worship. He fell at his feet and he thanked him for this blessing. And we shouldn't, of course, miss the fact that Jesus received his worship. Something 
no mere man, if he had any regard for God at all, would ever dare to do. Again, remember John, as is, is the angel, is showing him the revelation in, in the book of Revelation. He falls at the angel's feet to worship him. And the angel says, get up. I'm just a servant like you. Worship God. See, only God is to be worshipped. Here, this man worships Jesus, and he receives that worship. Now, notice here, too, that Luke points out this man was a Samaritan. Now, we don't know how many of these others were Samaritans. The implication seems to be that the rest were all Jews. Jesus did send them to the priests. The Samaritan would have been probably more likely to go to his Samaritan priest than to the Jewish priest because there were two priesthoods, only one valid one, the one in Jerusalem. But that's where the other men went. So it's likely that they were all Jewish men. Now, this wouldn't have been the first time that a foreigner, a Samaritan or a Gentile, was blessed by God and responded in worship, respond, received the mercy of God and then responded the way that he should. Remember Jesus meeting with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus offered her living water and she believed him and she received that life that he offered and she went into the city and she told everybody in the city, come and see a man who has told me everything about me. Is this not the Messiah? So. She received the mercy of God and she went into the city and she responded in the way that she should. She openly worshiped the Lord and began drawing people to the Messiah. Remember how Jesus helped the Syrophoenician woman, the woman who had the daughter that was cruelly demon-possessed. And She came to Jesus and pled for her daughter, how she believed in him and how he healed the little girl. And of course, remember the centurion who came to Jesus because he was concerned for his servant, something which seems almost unheard of, a Roman official concerned about this menial servant. He loved the servants in his household as he loved his own children and how he believed that Jesus could heal this man by just speaking the word. Jesus said of him, he had not seen such great faith in all of Israel. But then remember what he said to those who followed him in Matthew 8, verses 11 through 12. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That outer place is perdition. It's hell. It's not some compartment in heaven. Just in case you were wondering, uh, there are people who actually teach that. But notice, many will come from east and west. What he's saying is many would come from outside of Israel. He wasn't talking about the dispersion and the Jews coming back together. He was talking about Samaritans and Gentiles, people who were aliens and strangers to God's grace, who would gladly receive God's kingdom, while the sons of the kingdom, Abraham's natural children, those who were promised the kingdom, would actually be cast out. Now, this was a prelude or a foreshadowing of Israel's rejection and the gathering in of the nations. And I think that that's really the significance of what Jesus says next when he draws our attention to the other nine that left, verses 17 and 18. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed but the nine? Where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Well, there were nine others. Remember, there were ten lepers all together. They all received the same mercy. But they didn't come. They didn't thank him. They didn't worship him. They didn't worship God. And we have to ask the question, why didn't they do that? Well, because even though their bodies were healed, their hearts weren't changed by the grace of God. Now, we've all heard of the foxhole conversion. Remember, that's something that was made famous because of World War I where most of the war was fought in a trench, you know, just trying to survive in the foxholes. You know, you're in some kind of danger, some kind of need. Suddenly you become religious. You know, Lord, if you will save me from this particular thing that's threatening me, I will love you and I will serve you my whole life. And as soon as the danger is past, the newfound religion seems to go out the door and you return to living the way that you were living before. Now, the other nine, as long as they were in need, cried out for mercy because they were aware of that need and they, they wanted uh, some help 
But once they received that help, once they received that mercy, they went about their business as though nothing had happened. We're not even told whether or not they made it to Jerusalem. They seem to have uh, to remain unchanged. And certainly that was true of the majority of Israel. But notice that wasn't the case with this Samaritan. Jesus says to him in verse 19, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now he's literally saying in the original language, your faith has saved you. If you look in the King James, that's how this is most often translated. And sometimes it means, you know, it saved you from your condition, from your predicament. But often it means it has saved you. Your faith has saved you. You're not only whole on the outside, you are whole on the inside. The Lord has had mercy upon you. I believe the Samaritan had the kind of faith that saves. And I think it was revealed by the fact that he returned to Jesus and he worshipped him. Now when Jesus healed the man who was born blind, remember the man who was thrown out of the synagogue because he defended Jesus you know, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know, but I was blind, but now I see. Well, he was kicked out of the synagogue, but when Jesus found him and the man realized who he was, he worshipped him. Jesus asks him in John 9, verses 35 through 38, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The same thing happened when the harlot, remember, realized that through her faith in the Lord Jesus, her sins had been forgiven. She came to Jesus while he was with Simon, Simon the Pharisee in, in his house, while Jesus was with somebody who would likely despise her more than anyone else, and she openly expressed her love for the Lord Jesus Christ by washing his feet with her tears. And anointing, of course, drying with her hair and anointing his feet with this expensive perfume, which, by the way, was an act of worship. The point is, saving mercy results in worship. Those whom the Lord saves, worship him. Now, the question I want to ask us this morning as I close is this. How have we responded to the grace and mercy that the Lord has actually shown to us? Remember, we were like these ten lepers. We may not have looked like it on the outside, but we were certainly looked like it on the inside with regard to our spiritual condition in the eyes of the Lord. We were spiritually unclean, outcasts from God's kingdom and family, living in a miserable existence, although we may have thought we were having fun. And we were on our way to an even more miserable eternity. But the Lord had mercy on us. He healed us. He made us clean. So how should we respond? How should we respond to his loving us and purposing to save us from all eternity, which is what we saw, I believe, a week or two ago that the Lord uh, has towards us. That is his eternal purpose toward us. How should we respond to his sending his son to obey in our place and to die on the cross with our sins laid on him? How should we respond to that? To his guaranteeing eternal life for us. How should we respond to his sending his Holy Spirit to make us alive when we were spiritually dead and wanted nothing to do with him at all? The Bible says we were his enemies. We hated him. How should we respond to his declaration that we are just in his sight through the gift, uh, purely a gift of Jesus' righteousness, his adoption of us into his family, and making us his heirs? How should we respond to his governing all things using the power and the authority that has been given to him to rule and overrule all things in this life for our good, even our trials and the sins that we commit? How should we respond to his promise to bring us safely to heaven where he will love us and care for us for the rest of time? Well, the only right response, of course, is worship. We should worship him. Our whole lives should be that of worship. Now, Jesus asks this question, were there not ten healed? Where are the other nine? Is there only this foreigner who has returned to give glory to God? 
We need to remember that we were once foreigners. We were once strangers. Read you know, the book of Ephesians. We were alienated from God. We were you know, strangers to his mercy. We were without God, without hope in the world. But now we have been brought near by his mercy. We should set our hearts to honor and to worship the Lord in the same way that our Lord Jesus Christ gave his life to honor and to worship the Lord, as we've already seen some examples of uh, this morning, but we're going to see more this evening. Now, this evening, we're going to consider more about worship, and I think particularly why we might often find it difficult to worship the Lord the way we should. But for now, let's remember that we are to worship the Lord with our whole lives. And one of the things that the Lord calls us to do in our worship, besides what we're already doing here and the lives that we are to live, is to worship him by coming to his table. Because here we see our Lord Jesus' greatest act of love and mercy towards us in laying down his life for us. So let's prepare to worship the Lord by preparing to come to his table. Let's, let's begin by just a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply what we've just heard um, to our lives. And then I just want to read a short passage of Scripture and then we'll prepare ourselves for the table. So let's bow in a moment of prayer.